week he talked about uh, online matching and this week again he will continue on uh, exciting topics on online advertising which he can start okay uh thanks for the introduction so last week we started with this classic online by part-time matching model by Kap Vazirani, Vazirani, which are usually referred to as KBV. Um, and then we sort of move away from the KBV model and argue that uh, in, in scenarios like right sharing, uh, you need to consider more general arrival models. So um, in today's talk, we would like to move back to the original uh, driving force behind online matching, uh, which is online advertising and talk about some open problems in this literature and some recent progress uh, on these open problems. OK, so uh, so I'm going to first spend a few minutes, uh, give a review of online matching um, just to refresh the memory and just in case some some of the audience um, didn't attend last week's talk. And then uh, I would like to talk about a new technique called online correlated selection and how to use it to solve online matching problems and in particular how to use it to make progress on some of these uh, 10 year old open problems in online advertising. And finally, I would like to give you a brief uh, introduction to some very exciting late latest progress in online quality selection by several research groups, including uh, one um, that I participated in. Uh, but the, the main body of the talk will be at the second part, and uh, that will be the main technical part of today's talk. So uh, let me start with the review. Um, let me remind you what the KBV model is, uh, which again, uh, considered by part graph, one side of the bipartite graph we call offline vertices, and for concreteness, you can think of the offline vertices as the advertisers uh, of an online platform. And then on the other side of the bipartite graph, we have online vertices, which correspond to impressions uh, in online advertising. So the impressions arrive one by one, and when an impression arrives, we get to know which subset of advertisers are interested in the corresponding keyword, and um, those will be captured by the edges of the bipartite graph. And at that time, we need to decide immediately how to match this online vertex to an offline neighbor if there is any. Um, okay, so let's say we just do some um, arbitrary greedy matching, and then at some point, uh, we may in a scenario where the new online vertex is only neighboring to a few offline neighbors, in this case one, and that offline neighbor is already matched. So even though that you can see that there's an alternating path, so in principle, if we can regret some of the earlier decisions, we could still improve the matching size by one, but in the online setting, we cannot do that. So we have no choice but to leave this online vertex unmatched. And at the end of the day, uh, in the KVV model, um, at least the most basic version, then we only care about the size of the matching. So we just count. There are three edges uh, that we managed to match by the online algorithm. And in hindsight, uh, there's actually a perfect matching. So we just compare the size of the matching by the algorithm and the optimal matching. And that would be the competitive ratio. But more formally, we are considering worst case analysis. So given an algorithm, I need to consider this ratio against the worst case graph and also worst case arrival order and that smallest ratio is called the competitive ratio of the algorithm so uh, the main contribution from kvv other than introducing the model is this very elegant ranking algorithm which ranks all the offline vertices randomly at the very beginning and very importantly it is the same ranking that we keep using uh, over time so and then whenever an online vertex arrives, we just match to the off, uh, offline neighbor, or match offline neighbor with the smallest or the highest rank. Um, okay, so in this case, this will be the matching. And what they show is that the ranking algorithm is one minus one over e, which is roughly 0.63 competitive, which is also optimal uh, for this problem. So um, even if you Consider fractional algorithm, you cannot uh, do better than one minus one over E. 
And the main argument, main non-trivial argument behind the KVV analysis is the following alternating path argument. So it basically goes as follows. Let's pretend that this vertex V initially has a very uh, low rank so that it stays unmatched throughout the process. And in that scenario, the uh, dash matching is what we get. And now suppose we fix the rank of all the other vertices unchanged, but only improves V's rank to a degree that it now get matched to the first green vertex on the right. Then what it triggers is an alternating path. So because the first green vertex match V instead of the first red vertex on the left, the availability of this red vertex may further trigger another green vertex to match it instead of its original uh, match partner in the dash matching and so on and so forth. So it triggers an alternating path and also all the green vertices on the right are getting better because um, the alternating path are triggered um, precisely because of a newly available neighbor from each green vertex point of view and the green vertex opt to choose that new neighbor. So uh, all of them are actually getting better. So uh, that, that's the argument that we will get back to you and explain why it fails in more general settings. But now let me also review another uh, very important algorithm in the KBV literature called water filling, which is a deterministic uh, fractional matching algorithm. So, so the idea here is that I would like to match each online vertex continuously or epsilon by epsilon bit and each time to the currently least matched neighbor and the match portion of each offline vertex uh, is usually called the water level of that vertex. So for example, uh, using the same bipartite graph, the first online vertex arrives and has three unmatched neighbors. And then according to the water filling algorithm, it's going to fractionally match to all three neighbors up to one third. And then when the second vertex arrives, it has two neighbors. The, the top neighbor is completely unmatched and the bottom neighbor is already matched to one third. So to balance the water level, the second online vertex is going to match to the uh, top neighbor up to two third and match the bottom neighbor only by one third, but adding that to the existing match portion, uh, the second neighbor will also be matched up to two third after this vertex. And so on and so forth. Okay, so at the end, we get a fractional matching instead of integral matching. And in this example, it turns out that water filling is actually doing great. It, it gets a fractional matching that's very close to a perfect matching. And um, what we know about water filling algorithm is that it is also one minus one over E competitive. And this is optimal uh, even when we consider fractional algorithms. And the punchline behind this, other than the fact that it's a deterministic algorithm, is that there's no alternating path argument in its analysis, uh, which will explain uh, what I'm going to about to say in just a second, that uh, the, the idea of fractional water filling algorithm actually generalizes much better than ranking uh, in some of the open problems that we're going to talk about today. And beyond this unweighted KVV model, there has been many generalizations that have been considered in the literature. Uh, for example, if you want to think of different kinds of advertisers who are willing to pay differently for having uh, their ads shown, then that would motivate the offline vertex weighted um, setting where each offline vertex or each advertiser is associated with a weight and we want to maximize the total weight of the matched advertisers. Um, and if you consider even more general setting where the advertisers uh, actually check the cookie information of different impressions and will be willing to pay differently depending on the quality of the match, then uh, we are in the more general edge weighted problem. And finally, um, in, on advertising, it is usually the case that while well, an advertiser is willing to have its ad um, shown many, many times. Um, so, but the, each advertiser will set a daily budget so that on each day, I'm not going to pay more than that budget. So that motivates the AdWords problem where each advertiser can be matched over and over again, but the actual gain from the advertiser is a budget additive function, which means that it is either the sum of the 
the weights of all the edges that match to this advertiser or its budget, whichever is smaller. And the, the general message is that KVV only generalizes up to the, the, the vertex weighted setting. And for the bottom two problems, edge weighted on a pattern matching and AdWords, uh, KVV failed, fails to generalize. So uh, that will be the focal point of today's talk. Okay, now let me try to. Can I yes. ask you a question? Quick, quick. Yeah, so in the water filling, like this, going back to the previous slide, it's, it's right. rather uh, like it's fractional, but uh, like uh, generously so, uh, as in the fractional assignments would be something like one over n square or something at most, right? Or in fact, one over. Like when you, you're doing this assignments, they're fractional, but if you look at them as like ratios, it'll not be like one over two to three n or at any point of time. It'll always be small, like one over poly n, right? So the n says um, the number yeah, of. I, I agree that it should be poly, but I don't think it will be, it will necessarily be always be like a, a multiple of one over n. Because sometimes, like some of the vertices are maybe neighboring only to right. one neighbors and so on and so forth. So you basically have all these combinations. Yeah, something like half plus one third plus one fourth kind of thing. Right, so right, right. That'd so, be so like one that, over n squared. Basically, the precision is not a real issue here. Okay, but yeah, I mean, I guess I was saying that uh, yeah, if you think of the each left hand vertex as a large enough budget. I mean, I'm, I'm just seeing a forward connection to say that AdWords problem. If you have just- Right, 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 right. So- uh, Just enough budget. Yes, very, very good point. Um, so in the literature, like the two following two models are largely interchangeable in terms of the algorithm and the analysis. So the first one is that you construct fractional matching. And the other one is you make some kind of- uh, a uh, large market assumption that, let's say, uh, exactly. like B matching, each offline vertex right. can match up to B times uh, right. and be very large, or in AdWords, a right. uh, small bit assumption where the bid is, uh -huh. any single edge is much smaller than the budget. Uh, even though right. it's not formal reduction, but the algorithm and the ideas and the analysis are largely the same uh, in these two, two different scenarios. So, right. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Fractional assignment, right? So how right. do you convert that to an integral solution? Sorry, sorry. Can, can you say the last part again? So eventually, if you want an integral matching, right? How do you do that from fractional? Ah, okay. So um, you you. So what a feeling is a algorithm that's really targeting fractional matching. We don't worry about like getting an integral matching at the end of the day. Uh, but what you ask, it's actually related to today's talk because uh, basically you would like to have a rounding algorithm that you, you can round the solution in the online setting and at the end you get an integral matching. And that's uh, precisely uh, one, one of the things that today's technique will offer. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so um, let me uh, okay let, let me explain these two models in in maybe two three minutes. Um, so in the edge weighted online matching problem, as you can imagine, the the edges are associated with positive weights. Um, and then an important note here is that we assume that an offline vertex can be rematched, but only the heaviest edge counts in the final objective. So in other words, you can imagine that even though a offline vertex is already matched, is if in the future there's a much heavier edge arrive, then we have the freedom to dispose the earlier matched edge for free and get the heavier edge. Now let me explain uh, why this assumption makes sense. Uh, so first of all, without this assumption, there's actually no boundary ratio whatsoever. Uh, even with only one offline vertex, basically you are, you're saying that I have a bunch of numbers uh, arrive online and I want to uh, 
edge worth $1, uh, do you take it? And you have to take it with some probability if you want to be competitive. And then maybe the second vertex arrive with much higher uh, value W, and you have to take it with some certain probability. And this process just keep going. At some point, you, you don't have enough unmatched probability to take the new uh, vertex. So there's actually no um, bounded competitor ratio without a free disposal assumption. And in, in practice, we are act not actually disposing the earlier edge. So we call that the motivation is really from online advertising. And in online advertising, the advertiser is actually super happy if you want to show his ads over and over again. They just don't want to pay too much, right? So if, if you promise that, I mean, I mean, show your ads any number of times. But since we make a deal that we only charge you once, so I'm only going to charge you for the most valuable one, then the advertiser is actually happy, right? All those smaller edges are just additional uh, perks that they get for free. So um, because of this very well-motivated um, connection to, to on advertising, so the free disposal assumption has become the standard assumption. Uh, at least when worst case analysis is of a concern uh, in online uh, in X-weighted online matching. And another remark is that in the unweighted and um, vertex-weighted world, then this assumption basically makes no difference because in those worlds, rematching it the same vertex over and over again does not increase the objective at all. So without loss, you will not use this freedom of free disposal uh, un until you come to this X-weighted world. So what we know about edge-weighted online matching until last year is that greedy is still one half competitive, and the fractional water filling algorithm can be generalized to this setting to get a one minus one over e competitive ratio. And just like remarked earlier in the actual paper, they present the result as if this is a, a B matching scenario. Each advertiser can be matched up to B times for a very large B, and the ratio converges to 1 minus 1 over E as B goes to infinity, but I would like to phrase it as just a fractional matching algorithm. And in terms of integral algorithm, uh, then no better integral algorithm uh, beyond the greedy is known until uh, last year. And this is a one slide example showing why the alternating argument, or alternating path argument fails in actuate on our matching. So even I even consider a very simple case that the weight are the same for each online vertex. So it's online vertex weighted world. So let's imagine that the dashed matching is what we get. So the first red vertex on the left is matched twice uh, because when this vertex with weight 10 arrives, it still sees that, okay, I can gain $5 by rematching to this red vertex. So uh, that's what happened. And now let's assume that this vertex V becomes very popular and as a result, the first green vertex on the right is now matched to B. Now that will free up this red vertex on the left, the first red vertex on the left. And let's assume that as a result, the next two green vertices are rematched to this red vertex. So the, the vertex with um, $1 worth uh, was originally blocked by this early green vertex and now matched to it. And the other vertex now see that the additional gain is actually $9 instead of $5 comparing to the dash matching. So now it's also matched to this red vertex. Now, the first point here is that the it's no longer alternating path, right? Because this availability of the red vertex can be matched multiple times and you can have a cascading effect in the subsequent matching. And second of all, this last green vertex on the right, now it's completely blocked off by uh, the rematch of this red vertex to the other uh, green vertex with $10 worth. So this green vertex on the right actually becomes unmatched or becomes worth due to a new neighbor. And recall that in the original KVV model, in the presence of this new neighbor V, all the green vertices on the right are getting better. So we have some kind of monotonicity, but that monotonicity fundamentally fails uh, in the edge-weighted world. That's what makes it difficult. OK, so the other open problem, uh, Edwards, uh, I have already explained the setting. Each offline vertex can be matched many times with a uh, budget additive gain. 
And just very similar to the edge-weighted world, until last year, all we know is that greedy is 0.5 competitive. And the MSVB algorithm, which in some sense can be interpreted as saying that the fractional water feeling algorithm still generalizes to this model to be one minus one over competitive, but there's no better integral algorithm uh, beyond greedy. And also similar to edge weighted world, the alternating path argument fails. Uh, this time we assume that the red vertex, the first red vertex on the left has budget 10. And originally I have this uh, dash matching uh, or dash allocation. Um, and suppose that this V vertex becomes so popular that the first green vertex with $9 worth is now rematched to V. Now that free up the first red vertex and these two vertices uh, with $5 worth now are both matched to this uh, first red vertex on the left. So very similarly, you can have this kind of cascading effect uh, in terms of uh, what kind of changes in the matching uh, 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 this vertex V could trigger. And also more importantly, now this last green vertex on the right becomes unmatched because, well, all the $10, $10 in this vertex budget has been spent on these two uh, vertices with $5 worth, so the last vertex becomes unmatched due to this new neighbor. So once again, the monotonicity property that all the green vertices can only get better uh, due to the new neighbor or the, pop the increased popularity of this neighbor um, now fundamentally breaks down. Okay. He, uh, he can yes. I ask a sure. quick question? Um, what you're saying is like indeed like the, this specific argument, this alternating path argument fails, and right. the current analysis of uh, ranking algorithm goes through this argument. Which, right. Are these examples also uh, sufficient to show that the ranking algorithm as such doesn't work? Like all I'm very, saying is very, maybe there's a very good question. We don't have count examples to the algorithm itself, or at least um, or the, the, the analysis of the algorithm becomes so complicated that we, we are unable, unable to show that. Um, uh -huh. Actually, we, we are even unable to show that it's worse than one minus one V, let, let alone saying that it cannot break one half. But on the other hand, oh, okay. the alternative path argument is the only argument that we have uh, to analyze ranking. So. Um, if okay. someone can come up with an okay. alternative analysis, then, then maybe ranking can still generalize. But so far, many people have tried and failed. Uh -huh. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, because the failure of this, at least the argument that we know for ranking, so it is very natural to try to fall back to the water feeding algorithm, which has no alternative path argument to it. But the problem is how to round it, right? And that question turns out to be very tricky, and that motivates the technique of online correlated selection, which I'm going to explain. So just as a thought experiment, let's imagine that in a parallel universe in which KBV did not invent ranking, and because of the importance of online matching, so a researcher tried to beat the trivial one-half ratio uh, using a somewhat cumbersome way. So let's go back to why the simple greedy algorithm is one, one half comparative and no better. It's just this Z-shaped graph. So the first online vertex is connected to two offline neighbors and the naive greedy or deterministic greedy has to choose one of them, commit to one of them. And let's say it commit to the bottom one. Then it's going to be only one half competitive is the, if the second online vertex is only adjacent to the bottom offline vertex, right? Because you can see that the dashed edges form a perfect matching, but uh, this uh, di diagonal edge uh, blocks both edges in the perfect matching. But if you took only look at this example, then it is very, very natural to say that, well, randomness will, will help solve the issue. Um, if I match the first online vertex randomly to the two offline neighbors with 50-50 probability, then with probability one half, I'm going to guess right and get a perfect matching at the end. And overall, instead of only one half competitive, at least against this sample, I get a three quarter competitive algorithm. 
So if I want to generalize that idea to a algorithm that can it is well defined on general graph, here's one attempt. Um, for each online vertex, I'm going to try to I'm going to check all the offline neighbors and see how many times I have attempted to match that offline neighbor. And then I'm going to choose two candidates that have been tried the least number of times. Of course, if there's only one unique least tried neighbor, I just match to it with certainty. But assuming that there are two or more, I just choose any two least tried neighbors and match to one of them uniformly at random. Unfortunately, that very simple idea uh, does not work, at least it fails if we just use fresh random bits every time we need to choose between the two neighbors. So imagine that uh, the top one third of the right hand side online vertices are fully connected to all the vertices on the left hand side. And let's imagine that every time you choose the least try neighbors, I always choose the bo most bottom one. So what will happen is that the bottom two thirds of the offline vertices will all be matched with probability one half after this stage. And the algorithm is going to get a matching of size n over three after the first stage. Now I'm going to recursively do the same thing. So for the bottom two thirds of the online vertices, I once again pick the top one third of it. So that will be the next two ninth right hand side vertices, and they will be fully linked to all the bottom two thirds uh, offline vertices that have been matched to one half. And what will happen after this stage is that the bottom four ninth of the offline vertices will all have two attempts. And since we use fresh random bits, then they will all be matched up to three quarter. And I'm, I'm going to just repeat this process over and over again. And if you trust me, then at the end, we get n over three in the first stage, n over nine in the second stage, n over 27 in the third stage. And it's just a sum of geometric sequence. And in total, we get precisely n over two uh, edges at the end. So independent random choices uh, do not work. But of course, you, can, you will see that, OK, you're doing something very stupid. Why would you ignore which vertex has been matched in the past and use fresh random bits, right? I should have really looked at which vertex has been matched in the first stage. And then in the second stage, I just choose the one that hasn't been matched yet, right? So, OK, let's try that idea. And I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to do the same algorithm, but assume imaginary perfect negative correlation. What it means is that any offline vertex that has been tried two times will be fully matched. Then if I run the same example, I will notice that after the second stage, the bottom four ninth of the left hand side vertices will be fully matched. And then um, I just get a matching size of um, five, over five over nine times n. And in, this is not coincident just to this example. So if you have a perfect negative correlation, then the two choice algorithm that I explained is indeed uh, five over nine competitive. The problem here is that the perfect negative correlation is actually impossible, uh, especially in the online setting. So here's a very small example to show you that. So let's imagine that in the first stage, you need to choose between two neighbors, A and B. And the second stage, oh, sorry, in this, for the second online vertex, you have to choose between two neighbors, C and D. So, and let's imagine two, two different scenarios in step three. In the first scenario, you need to choose between B and C. Now, if you want perfect correlation, right, then whenever step one picks A, meaning that it did not pick, pick B, then B has to be chosen in step three, right? And if B is chosen in step three, meaning C isn't chosen that in that step, then C must be chosen in step two, okay? So in the first scenario, whenever step one picks A, step two has to pick C. Of course, by symmetry, you can imagine that what happened if step three need to choose between B and D. 
then by the same argument, you will reach the conclusion that whenever step one picks A, step two need to pick D. But this, this is impossible to implement in the online world because it's saying that subject to step one picking A, which vertex step two needs to pick is completely determined, but it's determined by what will happen in step three, but you don't know what will happen in step three in the online setting. Okay, so perfect negative correlation is not possible. So one question. So yes, uh, um, in, in, in your two choices, if you have constant choices, does this two or one point eight improves? Does it three choices or four choices? Uh, you mean like what? What if in each step I have multiple choices? Is that what you're asking? So constant number of choices. Let's say ten choices. Then right, one right, right. So that that's something that um, that's for the next step. So re remember, we're in a world where KDV did not invent uh, ranking, so we're only targeting to beat one half. So of course, supposedly, if we allow multiple choices in each step, that will allow us to hedge against different possibilities even better, uh, assuming our rounding algorithm also works with multiple choices. And uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit of result uh, in that spirit at the end uh, in the recent progress part. No, no, the reason I asked is when you have balls and bins examples, you right. have of two choices, but if you use any constant choices, you don't really improve a much. You improve a lot. So from log log in, you don't improve. So here, is it really powerful? Here it improves uh, because we are in a world where we're trying to optimize this constant comparative ratio. So I would imagine the ball and bin, uh, when you say you, it, it does not improve a lot because it's you're in the asymptotic world, right? You don't care about improving the constant, I, I imagine. Yes. I, okay. Yeah, thanks. OK, so um, again, back to here. So it would be great if we have the two, two choice algorithm with perfect negative correlation, then we would be able to beat one half. But uh, perfect negative correlation is not possible, especially in the on online setting. Now, what's the natural next question? How about partial negative correlation? Because we already get one half without any correlation. And with perfect negative correlation, we know that we beat one half. So it's natural to conjecture that, well, it sort of moves up smoothly if we have some degree of negative correlation. So any non trivial level of negative correlation will allow us to beat one half. So that's precisely uh, what motivates this concept online, motiv uh, online correlated selection. So when I define this concept called OCS, I'm going to call the, the, the choices the elements just to make it general enough, and maybe it's useful for other problems other than online matching. Uh, but you can really imagine each element as a offline vertex. So the OCS is an algorithm that takes a sequence of pairs of elements as input one pair at a time. And on receiving each pair, what I want is to choose one of them with 50-50 marginal probability. But for any fixed element, I also want the choices to be negatively correlated across different rounds that involve that element. And informally, it just says that uh, if the element wasn't chosen this time, then I want it to be chosen uh, with a higher chance next time. That's uh, the informal way to put it. And more formally, uh, for some parameter gamma between 0 and 1, we say a selection algorithm is a gamma OCS if any element that appears in k pairs, um, the probability that it is never chosen is at most 2 to the minus k, which is what you will get uh, if you only use independent random bits, and then further multiply by 1 minus gamma to the power of k minus 1. So gamma basically models the, the level of uh, negative correlation. So when gamma equals zero, once again, this is just the independent selection. And if gamma equals one, then you get that this probability is zero uh, whenever k equals to two. So this corresponds to perfect negative correlation. And in general, gamma will be some number uh, between zero and one. Now the least <laughs> Yes. Yeah, just to get my head around the definition, let's say, I mean, this is, uh, at least to me, it's non-obvious that such a thing can be accomplished even in the offline 
So if I just give you an entire sequence, like there's no online. I'm just asking that you have a collection of like these uh, collection of these tuples. Even then, it's not obvious that you can pull it off. So is that easy to see that at least for some non-trivial gamma, it's possible? Um, so like, in today's talk, I'm actually going to show show the algorithm. Uh, for a gamma that's smaller than uh, what we actually show, and that algorithm is simple enough to to be covered in. Okay. 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 Yeah, because I mean, offline, okay. I mean, existence is a different question, but then you can probably just write a linear program to sort of right, right, do right, this. Right. Of course, like the the so actually, magic is that like, this has to be done online. I'm. I'm also getting ahead of the, uh, the, 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 what I'm going to present next a little bit. So actually, we, we also know that um, or basically some of the hardest results that we can show for OCS actually apply to the offline world as well. So even I give you the whole sequence in advance, uh, there's sort of some gamma that you cannot uh, beat. So, so, so all the harness, okay, so the yeah, harness that we know actually applies to offline algorithm. That's what I'm saying. So, so maybe the online part is actually not the bottom uh -huh. of introducing the negative correlation here. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it's a very nice definition. I mean, appeals like uh, yeah, in of itself. Okay, so um, Great, let, thanks. Let, yes, <laughs> let let me let me just remark that. Uh, this is called semi OCS because uh, it is actually not in, not good enough for the uh, edge weighted online bipartite matching problem, but it is already good enough for the uh, unweighted and vertex weighted question, and it is uh, sort of a natural definition. So what we need, what the extra mileage that we need to to make it useful for the uh, edge weighted version of the problem as well, is a stronger notion that also gives you some guarantee. If you only cherry pick a subset of the rounds and ask what's the probability that a, a element is never chosen in that subset of round instead of all the rounds. So um, okay, so now I'm looking at an, any element and any k pairs that contain the element, not necessarily all the pairs that contain it, but a subset of it. And I'm further assuming that these k pairs sort of breaks down into m consecutive subsequences. So this is best explained using an example. So in this examples with seven steps, and element A is the element that I care about, then step one and step three form one consecutive subsequence because in no other steps in between contain this element A that I care about. And this step seven is another consecutive sub subsequence. And these two subsequences are so separated by step five, which also contain the element A that I care about. Okay, so if I have k pairs and it partitioned into m consecutive subsequences, then the probability that the element is never chosen is at most, once again, two to the power of minus k, which is the what you get by independent rounding, and then one minus gamma to the power of k minus m. So the more consecutive subsequences that it breaks uh, breaks down to, then the weaker the guarantee become. But that that's still uh, sufficient for the edge weighted problem. So th this this version uh, is somewhat convoluted, and I don't want you to sort of look at this uh, particular mathematical form of the probability bound and take it too seriously because. Uh, in some sense, it's something that arrived from the uh, the first algorithm that we introduced, uh, but not necessarily the right definition anyway. But the idea is, uh, the high level idea is really, I want to have some kind of guarantee on what's the probability that an element remain unselected after appearing in many, many times. Okay, so uh, what we know, um, so we have seen that uh, independent rounding is the trivial zero OCS, and it is impossible to get a one OCS because that corresponds to perfect correlation. And the same example, if you work a little harder, that actually show you that even one half uh, OCS is impossible. Because basically all you can do is to guess which of the two future it is, and then uh, you will succeed with only probably one half. 
And for the algorithm, we managed to introduce a polytime OCS uh, for gamma that is basically uh, 0.11, something like that. Um, So if everyone is okay with the definition, now I would like to um, show you an algorithm that is even weaker than I, what I just claimed. It's only one over 16 OCS, but the algorithm is very clean and uh, really demonstrate the main idea behind the design of the, the, the real algorithm. So now let me explain the algorithm. On receiving each pair, I'm going to randomly assign a type to that, to that pair, uh, it is either a sender or a receiver with equal probability. And furthermore, th for this pair, I'm going to randomly pick one of the element, and this element is not, not necessarily the final element that I choose, but in some sense, also a type of this pair. And then, if this, this pair is a sender, then basically I'm going to just choose with a random, fresh random bit. If it is a receiver, then I'm going to check the last time this element L appears in a pair, if that pair exists. And if that last time is a sender and also choose the same element, then I'm going to introduce perfect negative correlation across the two pairs. So what it means is that if L was selected last time, then I'm not going to I'm, I'm, I'm going to select the other element this time. If L wasn't selected last time, then I'm going to select L this time. So once again, if if it is a receive if it, if it, it is a sender or if it is a receiver, but the last time element L appears, did not choose element L or wasn't a sender, then I'm going to go back to this fallback option of choosing with fresh random bit. Um, OK, so th this definition um, actually has a equivalent in interpretation using the language of graph that I'm going to explain in just a second. But now let's break it down into uh, three parts um, just to help you understand. So the first part, I basically have some randomness that will help me um, determine which, which pairs will be negatively correlated. So uh, you can see that two pairs can be negatively correlated if, first of all, they both contain the same element L, and L did not appear in any other pairs in between. And finally, the earlier pair choose to be a sender and pick this element L, and the latter pair choose to be a receiver and also pick this element L. Only when all of these conditions satisfy, then I'm going to introduce perfect negative correlation uh, between the two pairs. OK, so uh, if all the conditions satisfy, perfect negative correlation. If not, I just go back to independent random selection. Now, as I claim, um, it would be better to really understand it using the language of a graph. So I'm going to introduce what I call a dependence graph where the vertices, or it, actually in the dependence graph, let me call them nodes and arcs, just to make a dif distinction with the uh, vertices and edges in, in matching. So I'm going to call each step in, in, and capture that with a node. I'm going to introduce a bunch of arcs that are the potential correlations that I can introduce between um, any two nodes. So two nodes or two steps are connected by an edge if the OCS may introduce perfect negative correlation between them. So it is very easy to uh, design these nodes. I basically go over all the elements. For example, I go over element A. Then I'm going to add an arc between any two consecutive times that A appears. So for example, A appears in step one and then step three. So there will be this arc from one to three due to this element A. And the next time the element A appears is step five then there will be another arc from three to five, and likewise from five to seven. And then I go to the next element B, then that will introduce an arc from one to two, two to four, and so on and so forth. So basically all the dash arcs are arcs between neighboring appearances of the same element. And I'm going to call this the ex-ante 
um, dependence graph. Now, after the realization of random bits in the algorithm, then there are certain pairs of nodes that are actually correlated. And I'm going to capture that using the solid arcs. And, um, okay. Now, how to interpret this? The, the randomness, random choice of sender and receiver, and also this element L between the two elements in the pair is really equivalent to having each node randomly pick one of its potentially four incident arcs. If it chooses to be a sender, it means that I'm going to choose the out arcs. If it chooses to be the receiver, it means that I'm going to choose between the in arcs. And further, the element I choose will specify which in arc or which out arc that I end up picking. So for example, if step three choose to be a sender and also choose element A, then it means that I'm going to choose between the two out arcs. And I'm going to choose the out arc that is due to this element A, which is the out arc from three to five. And then an, an arc is chosen in the exposed graph, or in other words, the two nodes are negatively correlated if both nodes manage to choose that arc. Now, any question about this interpretation? Uh, I think the, the last few minutes is uh, somewhat heavy in terms of uh, technical definitions. I, uh, one question, I, so why in step three and step seven, AC is appearing, the same age is appearing two times, or? What is happening in step? Okay, two? okay. So um, here we allow parallel arcs. So it is possible. If uh, let's say uh, step one and step two have the same set of elements, then I'm going to have two parallel arcs between them, one for each element. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, the important thing about this equivalent interpretation uh, is really the last step. So an arc is chosen in the exposed graph only if both endpoints pick it, right? So that would imply that it is a matching that we get at the end. So that brings me to the uh, to the point that the exposed graph is actually a random matching of the extended graph. So let's look at this example. Uh, let's say step one uh, choose to be sender and select element B and step two choose to be a receiver and element B and so on and so forth, then uh, I'm going to have this arc from one to two. Likewise, three to seven, because uh, they both select element C and three as a sender and seven as a receiver. And you can also see that uh, even though step five is a sender and step six is a receiver and they actually contain common element, but because step five did not choose element D, the common element, there will not be an arc between them. So exposed graph is just a random matching of X and um, And after the exposed graph is realized, any isolated step by definition is going to choose with fresh random bits. Because, well, when, when you check a condition of negative correlation, uh, the condition will not hold. And for each matched sender and receiver pair, the sender is going to choose with fresh random bit. And the receiver is going to choose oppositely with respect to the common element, and according to the definition of the algorithm. And, and that's basically the, the definition of this weaker uh, 1 over 16 uh, OCS. Now, why, why we choose a matching to begin with? Um, one nasty thing about negative correlation is the chain effect. So if you introduce very strong neg negative correlation between step one and step two, and at the same time, very strong negative correlation between step two and step three, that may potentially introduce positive correlation between one and three. Now, by, by choosing a random matching and only introduce negative correlation uh, using this matching, then I ensure that such chain effect will never happen. Uh, it is only negative correlation that I introduce into the picture. So that's that's basically the main idea why, 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 why you, we use the matching. 
Okay, so now, now how do I get this one of 16 OCS guarantee? Uh, so let's fix, fix an element. In this case, let's say element A, and let's think about what are the chances that A remains unselected uh, in step one, three, and seven. Actually, like one, one three, five, and seven. Uh, so these are the RLs that are relevant. And the first point here is that if any of these arcs between the corresponding steps are realized in the matching uh, in the exposed graph, then the fact that step three and step seven are chosen oppositely ensure that A has to be chosen, right? So, and the point here is that even though step three to step seven is an arc due to an element other than A, it does not make any difference. Uh, the two steps are still perfectly negative correlated and A will be selected exactly once uh, in these two steps. So we don't need to worry about this case. Now, on the other hand, if none of the arcs uh, between one, three, five, and seven is realized, then I claim that effectively from element A's point of view, the four step one, three, five, and seven are making independent random choices. And this is true even though three and five are actually receivers and inheriting the random bit from some other steps. But those other steps are still independent from like one and seven. So from element A's point of view, it is just as if it experienced four independent random choices and the probability that it has never been chosen condition or none of the edges are realized is still two to the power of minus four, one over 16. So in sum, if I pick any element and any subset of steps, for this element to be never chosen, I need the following conditions to hold. First, the induced exposed subgraph is empty. There's no arcs in the exposed graph or in the matching um, between the corresponding steps. And further, the K independent random choices in the corresponding K steps are all against this element that I care about. Now for the first part, um, it's not so difficult to show that the worst case scenario is that the uh, ex ante induced subgraph is just a path. In other words, there are no arcs due to the other candidate elements. Uh, which will only help this process. And then um, you can show that the probability of a path is completely characterized by this recurrence. Importantly, it, you can easily show that uh, the probability of the K appearances is precise about less than one minus one over 16 to the power of K minus one. And for the second part, well, that's easy. That's two to the minus K. And these two parts, use independent random bits. So all you need to do is just to multiply these two probabilities together to get the guarantee of a 1 over 16 uh, OCS. Okay, um, any question about this part? Because uh, before I move on. Makes sense. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, so let me very quickly go over um, what, what it means, what it implies in uh, edge weighted online matching and Edwards. For edge weighted online matching, uh, the OCS that we introduce allow us to marginally break the 0.5 barrier uh, to give a 0.508 competitive algorithm. Um, and the the main idea uh, behind the application of OCS is to convert the, the regional formulation into, in some sense, a coverage function. So the original problem can be viewed as a max function of each offline vertex. If I have multiple edges, I just take the max over the edge weight as my objective. So, so instead of thinking about a max function, I interpret it as a coverage function. So imagine that if a edge has weight W, then it's going to cover the interval from zero to W. And then if I have multiple edges, then I just take the union of the intervals that they cover and see how long that is. And of course that is just the max. Uh, that corresponds to the following viewpoint. So it's saying that, okay, 
uh, yi of w is the probability that you actually match to an edge with, with weight at least uh, w. So I'm going to have the following uh, step functions uh, after the, the matching. And as the algorithm proceeds, and whenever we assign more fractional matchings uh, to the to and run the OCS to choose between them. So instead of having a binary step function, I'm going to have these steps. And if a new edge with weight W3 is matched to I with certain probability, then you can imagine that this curve between 0 to W3 is going to increase by certain amounts. And uh, how much will depend on the guarantee of the OCS algorithm. And the actual increase in, in the algorithm's objective will be the area of this shaded region. And now we just try to generalize the, the fractional uh, water feeding algorithm as follows. I, I'm going to set a price for any match level. And if I have this shaded area that is the increase due to the algorithm, I'm going to check the total price of this shaded area and also calculate how much is left and be offered to the online vertex. And each online vertex is, is going to check all the neighbors and check how much it would have gotten if I choose that neighbor to be one of the two candidates. And then I just choose the two neighbors that will offer me the most and use those two neighbors as my uh, shortlisted candidates and run the OCS to choose one of the neighbors. Um, I just want to explain um, why we need a more complicated uh, definition of gamma OCS instead of original notion, or in other words, why we care about subsets of rounds involving an element instead of all the rounds. Now, the problem here is that in the edge weighted world, for the same offline vertex, I need to consider different weight levels. And for any weight level W, I will need to consider the rounds in which not only this vertex is a, a shortest element, but also the, the corresponding edge weight has to be at least W. And to bound, what's the probability that this vertex is matched up to weight W? It, we need to bound the probability that it is never, never selected in one of those rounds. So that's why we need to consider subset rounds instead of all the rounds involving a offline element, because once I set a weight level, then that will uh, screen out certain subset of the rounds potential. OK, so uh, actually the, the, the Edwards part is very similar, uh, but in, in the interest of time, let me skip that and just give you a very quick glance of some recent progress. Um, it's independent work by three different groups, and all three papers are on the archive. So um, this is uh, John work with my co-authors, and what we show is that uh, we can improve the, uh, the quality of the negative correlation from basically 0.11 to, to this number. And we also show that uh, it, you cannot do better than one quarter uh, negative correlation. So there's no gamma OCS for gamma uh, greater than one quarter. And as I mentioned earlier, this harness actually applies to offline algorithms as well. So even if I give you the sequence of pairs in advance, uh, you cannot design a um, selection distributions that satisfy gamma OCS for gamma greater than one quarter. And in terms of activated online matching, this will improve the compare ratios to 0.519, close to 0.52. Um, another group by Shin and An, uh, they designed three-way OCS. So that will relate it to the um, earlier question, what if we have multiple choices, constant number of choices, and so on and so forth. Um, well, I think they, what they get is a 0.509 compared, compared ratio, which is better than the original two-way two result, but it's also worse than the new two-way result. So it's, it's unclear whether they're getting uh, some, some extra mileage uh, due to having three options instead of two options. And finally, uh, another group by uh, Guy Blanc and Ch Charis, uh, Moses Charica, uh, they basically give a six-way OCS, uh, allowing six options. And this is the latest ratio for edge weighted online matching. And by the way, uh, in all of these techniques, actually you can use any of these techniques to get arbit like a lot arbitrary number of options 
uh, in each round. It's just that the, the, the quality of negative correlation uh, just de degrades so quickly as the number of options increases. So you, you, you can imagine that the matching approach that I use in today's talk is going to be very bad if you have many options because the, the dependence graph is going to be very dense and any matching is going to be very sparse and the quality of negative correlation is going to be not be very good. So, um, so we still don't have the technique that will make use of the full power of, of having arbitrary number of options uh, in, in OCS. And actually, let me skip this and also give you a... So for the semi-OCS version, then we have something that I, I believe is interesting. So we have a very general multi-way semi-OCS that allow you to assign arbitrary sampling, sampling masses in each round. So in each round, you can just specify mar marginal distribution across all the elements. And then the guarantee here is that an element that has total mass Y is selected with probability at least this, which is very complicated. So, so to help you understand this, if you use independent rounding, then essentially you only have the linear term in the exponent. And if you have the overly idealized bound by fractional matching, meaning that when you have uh, total mass Y, you are actually matched up to Y, then by taking the Taylor expansion, you have this number. And the bound that we get basically match this overly idealized bound up to the quadratic term and has a smaller constant in front of the cubic term. And in terms of uh, matching, then it allows us to round the water filling algorithm to give a close to 0.6 comparative integral algorithm for unweighted and vertex weighted matching. So um, we are actually um, getting close to having a real rounding algorithm uh, for water filling to, to come close to the 1 minus 1, 1 will be ratio. OK, so um, I'll, I'll leave that to the Q&A part if anyone is interested. So for today, uh, I talk about this new technique called online correlated selection, which is basically online rounding algorithm that try to um, do better than independent rounding uh, if, if all you care about is the probability that uh, each element is selected. And we give both polytime algorithms and impossibility results uh, for two-way up to multi-way um, OCS. And as applications, now the best compatible ratio for edge-weight online matching is 0.536, and for Edwards, it's the only marginally better than 0.5. Okay, uh, let me stop here and take questions. Sorry for overrunning. Thanks. Do you see, do you see, yeah. So do you see other applications of OCS like beyond uh, the matching context? Uh, of course, like there are two different settings side at the bottom, but it, it does seem like a nice sampling. Uh, in a sense, it's like power of two choices, but uh, yeah. Right, right. So um, I I have so so far. Um, I'm aware of some applications of OCS in other problems related to matching. Uh, uh -huh. But um, for, for other settings, I think the problem here is that in the online literature, it is not so often that we are in a world of constant competitive ratio. And it right. seems to me that OCS is mostly useful for improving the constant competitive ratio rather than um, like, um, uh -huh. Sort of changing log to constant, uh, so so that that's so so far the the, the applications are uh, have been in matching, uh, but I do hope that uh, we we can have other applications. Actually, so in, since you asked this, let let me uh, go for the open questions part, at least the more general OCS. I think hmm. in some sense it's online rounding, right? But but so far we have focused on settings where we only care like we have binary objective per element. You, you get one unit if you choose the element, you don't get any extra credit for choosing it twice, right? But in many scenarios, maybe choosing the element twice or three times have additional marginal gains. So can we have OCS for maximization problems with non-binary objective for each element? 
And mm -hmm. also, I think for minimization problems, uh, you can also explore similar online rounding ideas. Um, and I hope that the, the techniques here uh, could be useful somehow. Yeah, so some, like some generalizations of coverage functions that exactly, yeah, exactly. scale, uh, like look beyond the binary. Okay, maybe we should talk about this offline. I, I, yeah, I sure, sure. Yeah, I, I imagine like it would take some, yeah, offline discussion yeah. to, to explore. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, very nice talk. Okay, let me stop the recording and thank the speaker. And if you have any question, we can ask offline. Maybe after recording, we can have two, three minutes discussion. Okay, yeah, thank you for coming.